Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I am Tom Lally, Technical Sales Specialist with AM Industrial, and I'm uh, happy to be here to give you a little bit of a background on steam trapping uh, this morning. So I'm going to quickly go through the agenda here. Uh, we're going to really start off very basic. What is a steam trap and, and why is it used? Uh, then we're going to take some time to go through the the three basic uh, types of traps by how they operate, uh, which would be uh, temperature uh, driven traps, uh, density driven and velocity driven traps. After we go through um, you know the pros and cons and the and the features and benefits of the different types of traps, uh, then we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about applications. And the, the three common applications that you'll find in industrial facilities are, are what we call drip, tracer, and process applications. Um, and then within, within each uh, area of that steam system, the drip, the tracer, and the process, we'll look, at, we'll look a little bit about sizing. And then we're going to save some time. I'll try to save some time for question and answers at the end. Okay, so it, in a steam system, uh, you might expect there to be just steam in the pipe, but actually there's several fluids in there and medias and, and, and other byproducts that have to be addressed in a steam system. Uh, obviously, steam is, is the main fluid that you want to have in your, in your piping network and in your process. It is the uh, heating medium uh, that has the largest amount of heat per pound mass. Uh, for various types of utility fluids. So it is desirable to have that steam space um, occupied only by steam to be the most efficient. But as a byproduct of a steam system, you're also going to have condensate, which is just the, the steam that has given up its latent heat and condensed back down into a liquid phase. So that that condensate is a valuable byproduct though. It's still retains some energy in terms of sensible heat. And it is uh, basically um, chemically treated and, and, and slightly purified uh, water. So as a utility, as a byproduct, you wanna recycle that back to the boiler as best you can. So the most efficient steam systems will have uh, as close to or near to 100% condensate return as they possibly can. That's never a perfect scenario, but it's a, something to str uh, strive for. Also in the steam system, you'll have air and non-condensable gases. Now these are fluids that you wanna take out of the steam system as best you can. And it's, and it's the, the function of the steam trap to help you do that. Uh, both air and non-condensable gases, uh, just as the as the wording says, uh, do not condense. So they so even if they give up heat or cool down, uh, they do not uh, do not change phase from gas to liquid in the operating conditions of a steam system. So what they end up doing is just blocking space and uh, as a as a uh, major component of of the of the steam system it would it would could retard the flow of steam going into remote areas of a, of a piping network for example it also they also combine um, to provide a, a corrosive condensate uh, those gases dissolved into the liquid phase condensate will help to form carbonic acid which will eventually start to attack the metalwork in your in your steam systems. So those gases, those uh, those gases definitely need to be removed. Uh, dirt is the byproduct of that corrosion I spoke of. So uh, the 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 better that you can relieve the steam system of the air and non condensable gases, the better you can treat your steam at the boiler and and even in the distribution system, uh, you can. Uh, Help yourselves by re, uh, reducing the amount of corrosion and therefore the amount of dirt that gets uh, produced in the system. Now, some steam traps will pass dirt, some will not. 
and we'll look at that a little bit. Um, but as far as the steam trap goes, uh, we, you really have to think of a steam trap as nothing more uh, than a uh, automatic valve. And the automatic valve has to work based on positive pressure drop. There's some, there's some misconceptions in the marketplace that one particular type of trap by, by its uh, operation will push condensate better than another trap. And really, the, all traps will push condensate. It's de just dependent on the inlet pressure to the steam trap being higher than the outlet pressure to the, of the outside of the steam trap. As long as that positive pressure differential exists, condensate will flow. In a steam system, compared to, let's say, a hydronic system, you don't always have that positive differential, as we'll see. So that automatic valve that's in the steam trap differentiates between steam and condensate and steam and non-condensable gases. Uh, and it'll do that based on temperature differences. It'll do that based on density differences between a, obviously a gas and a liquid or velocity. The, the, the speed with which a fluid will flow through a pipe will vary or through an orifice will vary depending on whether it's a gas, which would be a higher velocity, or a liquid, which would tend to be a slower velocity. So the automatic steam trap then closes in the presence of steam, so it does not pass live steam. And basically, you want to be able to allow the steam to fill the space, especially in a process area, where it's, it's designed to give up its latent heat. If you allowed steam to blow through uh, a heat exchanger, for example, un, unrestricted, there would be no residence time for the steam in that in that space, and your heat transfer would be um, inefficient. So the steam has to be held in residence to give up its heat. Then, when that when that steam condenses and condensate is formed, you have to have a means of removing that condensate. The liquid phase will block the space. It'll block heat transfer, or it'll slow heat transfer. So that condensate needs to be removed efficiently and, re and recycled, as I mentioned earlier. Then also, depending on how, this, how your steam system runs, and we'll look at this a little bit in the application end, the presence of air in your system, either, either a lot of air or a little bit of air, will also determine what type of trap maybe you would lean to by its operation so that it can it, it can effectively vent out whatever air is present in the space. So the broad categories that I mentioned earlier, uh, thermostatic, it's a thermostatic type of steam trap is, is operating on a temperature difference. Mechanical types of traps are gonna be working on a density, level control typically, uh, type of difference between steam and condensate. And thermodynamic uh, is a broad term covering a lot of different types of traps, impulse traps, uh, what, ha what have you. But the thermodynamic, they're all basically working on a velocity principle. And we'll look at that in a little further detail. We're going to start off with the thermostatic. Uh, it's probably one of the earliest types of traps uh, ever manufactured, you know, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And these thermostatic traps, again, work on the temperature difference between steam as a gas and condensate as a liquid. Now, everyone knows that saturated steam uh, curve will give you, uh, for any given steam pressure, there's a corresponding st steam temperature. And directly at condensation, the condensate and the live steam occupying the same space will have that same temperature. So these traps have to work with, um, in order for them to hold back live steam, they have to be able to sense a slightly lower temperature and operate at a slightly lower temperature than the saturation steam curve. 
And they do that, these mechanisms do that by, by either a capsule or a bellows fill uh, or bimetal plates, which is over here on the bimetallic trap. Uh, and all those will sense a temperature cooler than live steam and will tend to close the trap off prior to reaching that live steam temperature. Since these are temperature sensitive traps, all of them, as you would expect, would be wide open when they're cold. So from a startup standpoint, air and non-condensable gases uh, being colder than live steam and cold condensate uh, being colder than live steam would tend to freely flow through the trap. So startup on these traps is fairly straightforward. Again, based on the principle that there's a positive pressure differential, once you, once you establish that positive pressure differential, condensate will flow pretty, pretty freely through the trap on startup. Once that condensate starts to elevate in temperature and, and approach live steam temperatures, then that bellows capsule or the bimetal plates will respond to the hotter temperature. And in the case of the bellows or the capsule, it'll expand out like an accordion and it'll drive the valve head onto the seat. The bimetal plates <clears throat> will expand at different rates and create kind of a clamshell effect and pull the valve stem and valve head up onto its seat, closing off the trap. And at that point, those, those traps will stay in that position until heat is lost from the body of the trap and the condensate surrounding the bellows or the, or the bimetal elements can cool off. And, and that'll, that'll open up the trap again, allow more condensate to pass. But you would expect that while that time delay is happening, while the heat's being being lost off the trap body and the condensate's cooling down, that you're backing up some condensate towards the steam system, which is which is which can be desirable. Uh, it can be detrimental to your system. It's just something that you have to understand with a thermostatic trap uh, that th that's the type of operation. They tend to um, d discharge continuously. Uh, sometimes they'll dribble. Sometimes, depending on the load, they'll just pass on a continuous basis. Uh, these are uh, these are typically uh, they can be used outdoors, uh, especially if you can install them in vertical piping. They tend to be self-draining if if allowed to self-drain by gravity in a vertical position. They will open up again when cold and tend to tend to drain condensate from the system. Liquid expansion is just one of the specialty types of traps in the thermostatic uh, family. In this case, there's a liquid filled bellows, but if you'll notice, that's on the downstream side of the valve head and seat assembly. And that thermostatic bellows uh, is then uh, exposed to atmospheric temperature. So this type of a trap is only going to operate at or below 212 degrees. So you would expect it to back up a fair amount of condensate into the system. But that's okay, especially for, you know, if you're looking for a crude type of temperature control device. So let's say you have a uh, an outdoor storage tank filled with water, maybe fire protection tank, and you just want to have a steam coil in the bottom to keep it from freezing. Uh, this type of a trap can be set to discharge condensate, let's say, at 150 degrees or 120 degrees, something along those lines, and you can do a, a crude form of temperature control on the, on the storage tank to keep it from freezing. Once again, it has all the same characteristics as the other thermostatic traps. It'll be wide open on startup, so it'll be uh, venting air, non-condensables, and cold condensate freely. So we we talked to, I talked about the uh, saturated steam curve, and this is the this is the relationship that you need to understand with thermostatic traps, 
is that they will always operate at some temperature below saturation. So condensate will be discharging somewhere below the saturated steam curve and therefore backing up some condensate towards the system, back towards the system. The, the, the actual delta T is going to vary by trap manufacturers. So some manufacturers will do what they call a near to steam temperature uh, profile, which is for the most part primarily distilled water inside of a capsule. So it's going to have a, a boiling point very close to your live steam temperature, and it'll tend to back up less condensate that way. In other cases, they'll use an alcohol and water blend, which will drop that. 212 degree boiling point at atmospheric pressure down to maybe uh, you know 20 or 30 degrees below sat any any given saturation temperature. So again, that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you understand that that's the operation of the trap. So we're going to move to the mechanical traps. And in this case, again, these are working on the density principle, density difference principle. Steam as a gas is much lighter than condensate as a liquid, obviously. And so you're going to get inside these products, you're going to get more or less level control. So there's going to be some sort of buoyancy, uh, some sort of uh, component in there that provides buoyancy. That component's attached to a lever arm and a pivot point, and on that lever arm is a valve head, which closes off on a valve seat. And the presence of condensate is, is then, is then uh, a, uh, an essential point in getting the trap to open and close. So the first one we'll look at is the, is the uh, inverted bucket steam trap. This is a very basic trap. Um, in this case, it uses an upside down bucket or coffee can or, or what have you that's attached to a lever arm again with the valve head on it. And that upside down bucket provides a pocket where uh, a gas can cause the bucket to uh, have buoyancy in a in, when it's surrounded by liquid and allow that bucket to float upwards towards the top of the trap. By having that bucket float upwards towards the top of the trap, the valve head is pushed off against the seat, and that shuts the trap off. So the valve head and seat are up at the top. Flow would come in down through the bottom of the uh, through bottom of the bucket, and then flow out through the top of the trap and out the outlet side. So steam as gas obviously will float the bucket since it uh, has a lighter density than, than condensate. But in the same respect, air and non-condensable gases will float the bucket. The problem with air and non-condensable gases is they're non-condensable. So all things being equal, if the bucket were to float up with air, close the trap off, the trap would then just lock closed and never open again. So all trap manufacturers install and drill a small bleed hole in the top of the bucket. And that there is, uh, is, is intended to allow the air and non-condensables to bleed out from the, from the bucket, allow the bucket to drop, to lose its buoyancy and fall, allow the trap to open, and allow the trap to clear the air. You can imagine that that's probably a slow process, and then in fact it is. It's, it's not a mechanical failure of the trap, uh, it is just a, a condition that the trap is going to work under. It's what we call limited air handling capability. But given time and given the opportunity to clear air, it will do so. And it will return, once the air non-condensables are clear, it will return to normal operation and, and work as a, a very effective steam trap. The uh, with, with inverted bucket traps, you do need to have condensate present inside the body to create buoyancy around the bucket. You do need a little bit of system pressure also to help overcome the weight of the parts. So 
in terms of in terms of operation, you you want to be careful about oversizing a, an inverted bucket trap because if there is a uh, insufficient amount of condensate coming to the trap, it cannot it cannot maintain a liquid seal around the bucket, and the trap will do what we call lose its prime, which again is not a mechanical failure. There's nothing wrong with the product itself. It's just an insufficient amount of condensate to maintain a liquid seal around the bucket. Uh, given time again, uh, it will reprime itself. If, if there's sufficient condensate in the system, it will reprime itself and, and return to perfect operation. Again, it's just something to consider if you have a variable condensate load that you have to be a little bit careful about sizing. And with, within respect to a one hour presentation, uh, we're gonna go into a little bit of sizing, but not all the nuances. So I apologize, but we can certainly address any questions or concerns or applications that you have uh, on a one by one basis. The second type of density operated trap is a float called a float and thermostatic steam trap or float operated. In this case, a, there's a sealed stainless steel ball float that's attached to a lever arm, which has the valve head on it and a pivot point. And the buoyancy of that float on the liquid liquid level pulls the valve head off its seat and, and back onto it. So it opens and closes at the same time. Most trap manufacturers rate the capacity of a float thermostatic trap strictly on the orifice size of the float mechanism. So the the, the rated capacity in any in, in any manufacturer's table will be based on the float mechanism itself. The interesting part of an F and T trap is the fact that there's got a T in the name, and there is a a uh, thermostatic temperature sensitive uh, secondary orifice built into the trap body. And that there uh, is, is intended for just an air vent and possibly cold condensate startup. So this trap combines actually two traps in one. The float mechanism is your primary discharge point. Your air vent is for startup conditions. So you put so you any any time you would have a startup condition where air and non-condensable gases are present and cold condensate is present from the just the warm up of the mass of metal, you have basically two orifices to allow all that all those fluids to discharge through. Where condensate was necessary to uh, keep the bucket trap primed to allow the bucket to float and shut off the trap, the, it's conversed in a float and thermostatic trap. The main orifice, the float operated orifice, is at the bottom of the trap in this case. And it's, uh, for the most part, liquid sealed under the liquid level of the water. So these traps can work on, on basically a dry line with, the, with very little condensate load. And the weight of the parts in this case Will, tr will close the trap, where the weight of the parts in an inverted bucket trap opens the trap. So that's the, that's the main difference between uh, the two density styles of traps. In, in both cases, as you can see from the pictures, each, each trap body retains condensate. So you have to be a little bit careful in applying these products outdoors where you're subject to freezing, for example. So both of these, if given the opportunity with the system shut down by purpose or by accident, if they're if these are retaining condensate, they, they will be subject to freeze damage, depending on the body materials. Uh, if it's cast iron, for example, they will more, more than likely freeze and crack. <clears throat> In both cases, the uh, mechanical and density types of traps, because they're working on a liquid level, they're going to be sensitive to load changes and they're going to more or less continuously discharge. Uh, the inverted bucket trap can uh, cycle 
on a lighter load condition. Uh, but if as soon as you start to get into a heavier process load, both of these traps will more or less be continuously discharging with, with really no shutoff cycle to them. And looking again at the saturated steam curve, since both of these traps are working uh, on a on an interface between the, the steam and the gap and the and the condensate, they're going to be discharging condensate virtually at life st at uh, at steam temperatures. So there's going to be there should be little to no backup of condensate towards back towards the steam system when when using a density style trap. The last last trap type we'll look at is the uh, thermodynamic steam trap. These are depending on the manufacturer, they're they're made in all different types of orientations and and, and configurations uh, without strainers, with strainers, what have you. Uh, but in general, they're all working with with one moving part, which is a flat stainless steel disc that moves up and down off the seats in the body of the trap. So the principle of operation here with a thermodynamic trap, again, is velocity uh, based. So we're going to be sensing the trap's going to be sensing the difference in the speed of flow of uh, gases over a surface compared to liquid. Over, over the same surface. So the, the, the principle is actually, uh, uh, Bernou it's, it's called Bernoulli's theorem, and it's the principle that creates lift in an airplane wing. Uh, so the velocity of air flying, uh, passing over the top of the wing is, is uh, flowing at a speed faster than the bottom of the wing, and the faster velocity on top actually creates a low pressure zone and the wing is actually lifted in space. So the same principle occurs here with the bottom side of the disc. As condensate flows through the trap, it, the system pressure just lifts the, lifts the disc up and condensate flows through freely. As gases start to reach the throat of the trap, they start to flow at a higher velocity underneath the bottom side of the disc and that creates that Bernoulli's effect, creates the low pressure zone. The disc is actually started to get sucked down towards the seats, pulled down towards the seats. In the case of steam, when you, when you have flashing occurring inside the throat of the trap, that flash, those flash steam bubbles is really what's getting the, the trap to operate. And as it's pulling the, uh, the this down onto the seat. At the same time, some of those bubbles of flash steam jump up to the top side of the disc. You have a difference in surface areas to apply force to, and those bubbles, those partial pressure bubbles of flash steam exert a downward force onto the top of the disc, and that gets the disc to snap closed. So this type of a steam trap is definitely a cyclical discharge. It's going to blast open, for a period of time and then shut itself off. So once the trap is closed and those partial pressure bubbles of flash steam are holding the disc closed, you need a time delay to allow the heat energy to be lost off the top of the cap. Those flash steam bubbles collapse, the force holding the disc down disappears, system pressure once again can overcome the weight of the disc and pops the trap open for the next discharge cycle. So if you think about it, the, with, with steam as a gas, flash steam as a gas closing the trap, air and non-condensable gases will have the same effect. And in fact, most thermodynamic traps can be used on compressed air systems as, as liquid drain traps for that very reason. So in a, in a steam system, you have to be careful, uh, similar to the inverted bucket trap, it's not a mechanical defect to the trap. It's just a characteristic of its operation, and the trap will clear the air eventually. 
and there's never a perfect metal to metal sheet and the air will dissipate through the trap and the trap will go back into normal operation. So it's not mechanically failed, it's just what we call airbound. And on, that's a condition that's kind of typical on startup. But if you know that and you can plan for it and you can uh, tolerate a, a time delay, trap is perfectly uh, acceptable for a lot of applications. And then looking again at the saturated steam curve for a thermodynamic trap, it's going to be discharging pretty much maybe uh, two degrees below saturation temperature. There, there's, a, there's always going to be a little bit of backup behind a thermodynamic trap. It's uh, as soon as as soon as the pressure pressure drop occurs inside the throat, you'll always get flashing. So that hot condensate will flash. That'll tend to close the trap off before live steam reaches it. So there's always going to be a little bit of subcooling. You know, any like I said, about two degrees. But it's going to be a, it's going to be what we would consider a hot discharge trap. So that kind of summarizes, this slide summarizes um, the characteristics. So we use two, two characteristics to kind of describe the trap. Uh, the amount it subcools or the amount of, uh, the amount of temperature difference it's going to operate below saturation and its ability to handle air and non-condensable gases. And if you look at the chart here, you, you've got the, the basic tra trap types, thermostatic at the top, balanced pressure and bimetallic and liquid expansion, float thermostatic and inverter bucket at the bottom, obviously. And it gives you the usual discharge patterns, blast action. So the trap is definitely a, a thermodynamic trap, for example, is definitely a cyclical open and closed type of operation. You would expect then a small amount of condensate backup. Balance pressure, uh, thermostatic, uh, very light loads. It will tend to cycle on and off because the time delay that it takes uh, to get uh, to lose temp temperature will allow condensate to back up, and it'll it'll blast out and then cycle back off. On on heavier loads, uh, it'll be more or less a continuous dribble, as would be the bimetallic and the liquid expansion thermostatic traps. They would be continuous dribble in operation. But as we mentioned, because they're temperature driven, those three traps are temperature driven, they're all wide open on startup, so they're all excellent air vents. And then lastly, the two density traps, the float and thermostatic uh, and the inverted bucket. Float and thermostatic is more or less going to be continuous discharge. It's, it's going to be very difficult to find that trap fully closed off under most conditions. It's always going to be discharging. By virtue of the thermostatic air vent in there, it also happens to be an excellent uh, air vent and non-condensable gas vent trap for startup purposes. Uh, inverted bucket is going to be on light loads. It's going to tend to cycle similar to the thermodynamic trap. It'll, it'll cycle off, you know, never fully closed necessarily, but it'll, it'll tend to cycle flow on and off. Uh, under heavier loads, it'll act more like the float and thermostatic and it'll just be a continuous discharge. Because there's no real air vent in, a, in an inverted bucket trap, no, nothing practical anyway, uh, it is gonna have a limited air handling capability. Tom, I have a question yes. um, that was presented. Uh, you mentioned all these different style traps, but you didn't mention universal style trap. Uh, can you explain the differences between universal trap and what you've been talking about so far? Sure. Um, universal series of traps, most manufacturers now provide a technology that allows you to put in a, uh, a two-component two steam trap, one, one, would, one being a, um, sw uh, some sort of a connector piece, a pipeline connector piece, which has a flange and a two-bolt connection on it. And then a trap module, any of the trap modules that we've talked about here, except for the liquid expansion, uh, would be available as a bolt-on piece to that pipeline connector. So 
uh, we'll we'll see that in a, in a couple more slides. But what it does is gives you the advantage uh, of being able to remove a trap quickly from a steam system without necessarily breaking pipe. So uh, you can apply any of the any of the technologies, like I mentioned, except for liquid expansion uh, to to that connector series. And we'll we'll look at that in a minute here. Okay. But thank you for the question. Okay, so now we're going to look at applications real quick. Uh, unfortunately, um, it would be great if there was one universal type of steam trap that could work in every application. Uh, sadly, that's not really possible. Uh, different different operating conditions, different load conditions. Uh, Different piping arrangements uh, dictate that there's no one uh, solution to every application. So what we're going to look at here is, is what the application is going to require the steam trap to do. And then at the end, we're going to kind of try it. We're going to, I'm going to bring together what the traps characteristics are, what the application characteristics are and bring and marry the two together. So that you know gives you some sort of a, a guidance as to what type of trap might work best in what application. So from a steam main drips, this these are the common applications in every steam distribution system. You have to be able to drain the condensate out of a steam main for energy efficiency reasons, for safety reasons. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been around a steam main when it has been experiencing water hammer. It's not a very comfortable situation to be in than when the pipe's jumping off its supports. It can be very dangerous. So you need to be able to maintain a dry, as dry a line as practical in a steam distribution system. So these, these drip, drip pockets and, and drip traps are placed strategically throughout a distribution system uh, in a horizontal run of pipe, maybe every Two, two to 300 feet um, at changes of direction, especially vertical changes, uh, risers, uh, the entrance to uh, an expansion loop, um, which could be vertical or horizontal. Um, certainly at takeoffs, uh, as it's shown on the right side of the slide, uh, where, where, you're, where you're feeding a steam control valve or a piece of process equipment. The last thing you wanna do is take off from a steam main and go and elbow directly into a control valve. Uh, that control valve is not going to last too long in service without uh, clean, dry steam uh, flowing through it. So the main thing with drip legs, uh, number one in terms of piping layout, is just to make sure the pocket's sufficient to allow condensate to, to drop in by gravity. So for a, for a pipe. Uh, let's say up to six inch diameter, you want that drip pocket uh, below it to be uh, four inches, nothing nothing less than four inches. So if you have a two inch pipe, you, ha you have an equal size T in a two inch pocket. Uh, six inch pipe, you can use a reducing T in a four inch pocket. Above, above six inch, then you want to go maybe a pipe size or two smaller, uh, nothing ever less than four inch. Uh, and but kind of kind of nominally two to three pipe sizes below. So if you have a if you have a ten inch diameter steam main, you probably want to have a six inch uh, drip diameter drip pocket. So the other thing with the drip pocket is you want to have uh, sufficient length uh, coming down from the steam main to create uh, what's called a hydrostatic head on the trap inlet. Uh, so on startup. If you're starting that steam main up the first time, you have to bring the mass of metal up to the operating pressure and temperature of the steam, the desired conditions of the steam. That's the worst case for condensate creation, and it occurs at the least amount of pressure. So once again, steam traps are nothing, nothing different than any other automatic valve. They need a positive pressure drop to uh, create flow. So that vertical drop, that L dimension, gives starts to give you hydrostatic head pressure on the trap inlet. 
under those startup conditions. The other thing that's that's shown in here at the bottom, drain valves. Uh, you have a mud leg where the trap comes off. That that mud leg obviously by its name will collect dirt over time. So those drain valves should be exercised probably annually. So you keep that drain uh, that drip pocket clear of dirt and debris. The other reason for that drain valve is for a startup. If if you pipe everything correctly, and we don't have time to go into the details of that scenario, but you can literally go into the boiler room, flip a switch, and at, at three in the morning, four in the morning, and have your steam system come up to pressure and temperature naturally, and have all the condensate drain out, and do what's called an automatic startup. Very, very few steam systems are piped that way, unfortunately. So most of the time you have to do what's called a supervised startup. For safety purposes more than anything else, you, you need to go around and open up those drain valves and allow that cold startup condensate and air and non-condensables to, to pass to, to waste uh, through those drain valves to allow some pressure to build up in the steam main and then go back and close those drain valves and allow the trap to take over the job of clearing the condensate. That's what's called the supervised startup. And by far, uh, the, more, the more safer way to start up a steam distribution system. And again, the way most are piped, uh, the, the more practical way to avoid water hammer. <clears throat> These two charts here are basically just give you a comparison uh, for a startup condition and a, and a running load condition for a given steam main. So if you look at it, we're looking at an eight inch diameter pipe at 100 PSI. To start that, that eight inch pipe up, you have to bring again the mass of metal up to 338 degrees. That's the, that's the temperature of 100 pound steam. You have to, raise the temperature of that entire piping network to that to that point you're going to pre we're predicting about 100 pounds of condensate per hour per 100 foot of linear run of pipe so if you're doing an automatic startup you need to size the trap for that kind of a condensate load 100 pounds an hour per 100 feet so if your drip pockets are every 200 feet you would double that Steam trap would have to handle 200 pounds an hour. At the bottom chart is the same eight inch pipe at 100 PSI, but now everything's up to uh, temperature. Everything's warmed up and now it's what we call a running load condition. And you can see that that load has dropped off more than half. So if you're doing a supervised startup where you're, where you're blowing off all that startup condensate, then the steam trap only has to really handle uh, 41 pounds an hour per hundred linear, linear feet. In any case, what a rule of thumb uh, that I can tell you about drip traps is that by and large, if you go, if you canvas all the manufacturers that are out there and you look at an inverted bucket trap or you look at a thermodynamic trap at 100 PSI, and you look at these kind of load figures that are in these charts, you're going to find that that virtually, you know, 99% of your applications, a half inch or a three quarter inch size steam trap is all you're going to really need. They're going to they're going to do on average four to six hundred pounds an hour, let's say, uh, depending on the manufacturer and how they design it. But there's going to be a, a pretty good safety factor on the trap capacity versus these loads. There are always going to be exceptions, and we can talk about those individually, but by and large, half and three quarter inch is all you really need for a steam trap size. The one thing you don't want to do is if you have a two inch main and you make a two inch pocket, you don't want to elbow into a two inch steam trap. I can guarantee you that, that, there's, that the trap's not going to last you very long in service. You do not line size steam specialty products, generally speaking. So uh, you wouldn't do that with a pressure reducing valve or a control valve. You don't do it with a trap, which is an automatic valve in itself. So same, same rules would apply. 
Second one is uh, what we what we consider steam tracing. That's an industrial practice, you know, for freeze protection or for product protection to keep products in outdoor piping from solidifying. The best analogy in in let's say food or pharmaceutical applications would be steam in place uh, requirements, where you're sterilizing product transfer lines or you're sterilizing um, in place uh, reactor vessels, things of that nature. So in the, in these cases, uh, what you're looking to do is to achieve uh, certain temperature in the on the product side or in, or again in the sterilization, you're, you're looking to say, for example, 121 degrees Celsius. Uh, so you can sterilize in place piping networks. Uh, these kind of conditions, you're looking at primarily, you know, thermostatic traps or thermodynamic traps. Uh, if you were if you were working in an asphalt plant or a sulfur plant in a heavy industrial complex, those products will set up well above, you know, 250, 300 degrees. Uh, you want to have a steam tracer or 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 a steam jacket that's completely full of steam. You don't want any potential for condensate to back up. You might want to consider, a, in a critical application like that, you might want to consider a thermodynamic trap. Uh, if you're in a food and pharmaceutical plant and you're steaming in place uh, process piping and process vessels after every batch where there's a lot of air and non-condensables to consider, well, the thermodynamic trap would work, but it's not, but it may not give you the best startup startup time. It might delay the process. In that case, a thermostatic trap might be better suited, as long as you understand again that a thermostatic trap will back up condensate towards your process process piping. So if you maintain a good distance, if there's a good distance between, let's say, a thermocouple that you're using to prove out uh, sterilization temperatures, you, you, you put a little bit of distance between that thermocouple and the trap inlet so that it can, it, you can accommodate backup without flooding the thermocouple. So everything can be handled. And, and ten, nine times out of 10 in the, in the food and pharma industries, we see thermostatic, balanced pressure thermostatic traps by and large used. Another advantage of that type of trap is that it can be manufactured uh, in a sense for with sanitary with more of a sanitary design. Nothing is ever crevice free with a steam trap, but you can uh, manufacturers make the balanced pressure thermostatic trap specifically in sanitary body conditions, tri clamp end connections. Uh, a tri-clamp body connection where where the two pieces fit together, and it can be easily cleaned and and readied for the next batch operation. So for tracers, the main thing is you want to just keep uh, keep them individually trapped. The the top picture here, figure 26, shows two individual tracers trapped by one trap. It's a process we call gang trapping. It's not recommended. There's always a pressure difference between the two, two circuits. Tracing applications, if you are doing industrial work, uh, you can start to look at manifolds for the supply and the, and the collection of condensate. And in these cases, you are um, getting a, a, an opportunity to uh, clean up your piping network. It, it won't, won't be so much of a spaghetti uh, look, you know, with uh, traps just hanging in air, uh, it cleans up the installation and makes it a little bit safer for you. This is what we were talking about earlier with the question about the universal traps. These are these are typical um, trap stations uh, that are available by a, again a, most of the manufacturers are offering these types of technologies, and they can be flanged, they can be threaded, but in in most cases you have uh, Inlet and outlet isolation. You have inlet bypass, so you can you can drain upstream but still isolate the trap. You can blow down for testing. You can blow down strainers if they're built in. And as the picture on the right, uh, excuse me, on the left shows, the trap module would would have a two bolt connection to the 
to the trap station. So you can put thermodynamic, thermostatic, float thermostatic, any of the any of the different types of traps would universally bolt to the connector. So the advantage here is it gives you a nice compact installation and it eliminates a lot of the uh, leak, leakage points. A conventional trap set, especially in threaded joints, all these connections uh, up at the top are uh, potential leak points, which you don't have at the manufactured trap station. Finally, with applications uh, for process equipment, this is where you, you're, you're, you want the steam to condense to give up its latent heat to the process. So you're cooking something, you're, or you're heating air, heating water, or whatever you're doing, this is where you want the steam purposely to give up its latent heat. By and large, these are all either temperature or some, some other process, secondary process condition, they're all controlled by temperature, pressure, or, or maybe flow on the secondary side. So there's always a steam control valve on the inlet going into the space, uh, and then a, a, a barrier for heat transfer from the hot side to the cold side. <clears throat> These applications, uh, it's most important to have uh, condensate drain out of the steam trap by gravity. Uh, these are these tend to be either batch operations. They could be continuous, but they're going to have uh, different uh, um, load changes. They're going to have different uh, load demands on the process side. So the condens steam condensate loads are going to vary all over the place. Uh, but with the uh, with the surface area of the heat exchangers generally being constant in 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 most applications, the only thing that can vary to give you heat transfer is the temperature of the steam. And when you when you vary the steam temperature, you vary the steam pressure. So whereas a drip application, you have constant pressure, you know, a hundred pound steam main, you always have 100 psi on the inlet of the trap. With the with process applications, because of that modulating control valve, you don't have a constant steam pressure at the inlet of the trap. That's why it's important to have the traps drained by gravity to a, to a vented condensate system. And you also have to have a drop uh, in elevation from the equipment outlet to the steam trap inlet. And there again, you, you're creating uh, a condition where you're, you allow condensate to uh, collect in that leg, vertical leg, and create hydrostatic head pressure on the trap. That hydrostatic head pressure will allow the, the condensate to flow. But you'll also notice at the top of the exchanger, you have vacuum breaker and, and basically an air vent. And, and because steam collapses in its space, uh, it will draw a, a vacuum once it condenses. So as long as you have vacuum at the inlet and atmospheric pressure at the outlet of the steam trap, you no longer have a positive pressure differential across the trap. So the vacuum breaker is placed there to allow atmosphere to be on both sides of the trap. And then you work on the hydrostatic head pressure of the steam trap. So some of the, so in this example, we're just heating steam with water. There's a rule of thumb equation that most manufacturers use. If you, if you have a, a flow of water going through an exchanger, it's the gallons per minute divided by two times the temperature rise on the water side. And that gets you into a rough neighborhood of what the condensate load is on the, on, the, on the system. You can use that for sizing the steam piping, the condensate piping, the control valve, the steam trap as a, as a rule of thumb. So we have so most manufacturers publish also uh, additional uh, rule of thumb formulas and then also some specific formulas. You know, if you want to get into um, the engineering units and want to do a, an exact calculation, the the exact formulas can be used. What you'll notice in most cases is you have a a true latent heat uh, value under underneath the equations. So you can take the actual uh, 
steam pressure and its and its corresponding latent heat and and use that ex uh, effectively in the equation and it'll give you a more precise steam flow calculation and, and whatever goes in with steam comes out as condensate so it's the same steam in condensate out would give you the same flow rate <clears throat> safety factors you know are going to vary by manufacturers but most of the time you're looking at anywhere from a most most recommendations are a two to three times safety factor um, so if you have an exchanger for in the example before us we had an exchanger that was rated for 855 pounds an hour if we look at the safety factor loads uh, we're looking at uh, let's see but let's take it as a storage heater two times safety factor um, So you would have to, you would multiply the 855 by two and then look for a steam trap in a catalog that has that capacity. There again, with that modulating control, you have to be careful about what pressure differential you use. And in most cases for, for process applications, you do use a half a PSI. So lastly, to kind of, kind of uh, go through the, uh, applications and then the track requirements so the applications are at the bottom uh, drip traps uh, drip applications the discharge you want you don't want to back up condensate deliberately into the steam main but you can afford a little bit of backup continuous or intermittent uh, discharge is okay you want a, as little subcooling as you can but in terms of air handling unless you're starting that steam main up three o'clock in the morning every single day you, you once you start it up there's very little air non-condensables to cons be concerned with so we wouldn't be too concerned about a trap that had limited air handling capability uh critical tracers and uh, tracing and, and and steam in place applications uh tracing you know in an industrial that's usually on in the fall and off in the spring once again, you don't want you don't have a lot of air to handle. If you're doing sterilization in a food and pharmaceutical, that's more batch operation. There, you'd you'd have more air to be handled. So you'd have uh, a steam trap that ha would be would be uh, able to handle air better. Uh, in most cases, you want you know, you know a little bit of backup is not is not uh, too critical in those applications. Uh, process. You know, you want to have continuous discharge as fast as that steam condenses. You want to have it to drain out. Very little subcooling, and those types of things again are either going to be batch or or going to have air um, vacuum breakers attached. So you're going to have a lot of air to deal with in process. So you want to have uh, a steam trap that has excellent air handling capability. And then you look at the at the top side of that chart at the balance. You know, balance pressure by metal, the thermostatic traps, they do back up, so you have to be careful, but they're, they're all excellent air vents. Inverted bucket uh, doesn't back up condensate, would be good for processor drips, but it has limited air handling, so you want to be careful applying it to a process. Float thermostatic, virtually no backup, and an excellent air vent. And nine times out of ten, a manufacturer will recommend F and T for process application. And then the disc traps, um, thermodynamic traps, they're intermittent. They will back up a little bit, but in a properly sized steam main, they're not going to be a problem. Uh, and but they are limited air air vents, so you have to be careful on startup. And that's pretty much. Pretty much the presentation. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions at this time. Uh, if anybody has any questions, if not, then thank you very much, Tom, for the presentation. Thanks, I Mark. appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it was very informative. And uh, again, everyone will get an email from me. If you have any questions, you can. Uh, Email me when you get the uh, the, rest of the email from me with all the information from the presentation as well as the uh, link to the recording.
Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, have a good day.